Hello calculus fans. Today we are going to talk about work. This section is going to require calculus of course and also some basic physics which we'll review along the way. But in everyday life work refers to an activity that requires muscular or mental effort. In science the term refers specifically to a force acting on an object and the object's subsequent displacement. Force is, used, is a term used to describe the amount of push or pull on an object. In this section, we will learn to calculate work. The applications run from compressing railroad car springs and emptying water tanks to forcing subatomic particles to collide and lifting satellites into orbit. And of course, there are many other applications. Work and energy are closely related. In fact, they have the same unit of measure. We'll talk about the units of measure also in this lesson. But basically work is something that is done on objects and energy is the capacity to do work. And you'll learn all about the relationship between these concepts in your physics classes. Let's look at the methods for calculating the amount of work done. The first case is when you have a constant force. So a constant force, this is the easiest case, moves an object through a distance d then the amount of work done in moving the object is work equals force times distance. Again, this is only for a constant force. And in this case, we don't even need calculus. We just need multiplication. We can even imagine a picture of this. This is a force versus distance curve. You've got your distance here. The force is a constant force. And since we multiply these in this picture here, work would just be this area of this rectangle. So work, which is just force times distance, is just this area under the curve. And this is an easy curve to find because it's a horizontal line. So you can see it's just a, a rectangle. The area of a rectangle is length times width, which plays out in this formula here. The work equals force times distance. Of course, if this is the only kind of problem we had, we wouldn't need calculus. So what we're going to be more concerned with is when we have work with a variable force. One thing also to note while we're right here, you can see when you consider the units of work, the units of work are going to be the units of force times the units of distance. And we will be using uh, both the metric system and the uh, U.S. system when we, can, when we calculate work. When we're working with a variable force, so the force is going to uh, it's going to vary along the way, as you can see in this graph. The, this is a force, so the force is increasing, then it decreases. So it's it's a variable force. So in that case, we're going to have to replace this formula by something that's going to take the variation of force into account. And of course, we can do that with integrals, an integral formula that will take the variation of f into account. In this case, we calculate the work done by a variable continuous force, so we're still dealing with continuous functions. This is calculus. Directed along the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b with our new formula. So you can, you can see the force times distance is in here. It's still, it's in the formula. This is the variable force formula for work. And of course we have this is the force at distance x, right? The force at distance x, and then dx is a little change in x. It'd be like the little distance. So we still have force times distance. And of course, over here, if we interpret work as the area under the curve, then we don't have an easy formula here like we did last time for length times width. So what we do always in calculus is we consider a little rectangle here, right? Just like in calculus, if we're going to try to approximate the area under the curve, we do this by breaking up the area into a whole bunch of little rectangles, and then we take the limit of the Riemann sums. So if we take a closer look at the picture here, we can see that the area underneath this curve is going to be the work, just like before, and we can approximate this work by 
if you consider this little rectangle here. So we've got basically this right here is the force at x, at, at point x, and this little tiny piece is dx. And you can see the formula right here for force times distance, a little tiny distance here. And what we will do is just use a Riemann sum. So we will, to figure out this, the work in this curve, we'll do like we always do in calculus, we use this Riemann sum to calculate the area. And we will say that work is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of these of these little rectangles. So we have f of x sub i star, which would be like a sample point, any point inside this little tiny rectangle, and then times delta x. And of course, when we take this limit, we end up with the integral that we've already learned about. It's the integral of the function f of x dx from a to b. And then when we're doing these work problems, we'll be using integration to calculate the work involved. We also use the above formula to determine the work required to pump out liquid from a container by considering lifting the liquid out one thin horizontal slab at a time and applying the equation work equals force times distance to each slab. We then evaluate the integral. This leads to as the slabs become thinner and more numerous. So we're gonna think about these little thin slabs and we'll take the, figure out the work required to lift each one of those one at a time and then we'll integrate where all the slabs are. In the process of doing this, we're going to come up with different units of measure. So when considering force, of course, we've got the, the international system, or the SI system, and that unit is Newton's, abbreviated capital N. And then there's the U.S. customary system, which we keep insisting on using for some reason. Uh, the United States, along with uh, Myanmar, or used to be called Burma in Liberia, and that's it. Everybody else is using the much better and easier, much easier metric system, but we are stuck using pounds. And if you're gonna have our system, why not have something like LB stand for pound, right? So that's what we're using for force. So when we're talking about force, force is measured in Newtons with the metric system or in pounds with the US customary system. Another thing we'll be talking about a lot is work. So work in, in the metric system is measured in Newton meters, which is, are also called joules. And these are abbreviated capital J. In the US customary system, we will be using for work foot pounds. Sometimes it'll be abbreviated with a little dot in the middle, which actually makes sense because it really is a unit of feet times unit of pounds. Uh, other times you'll see it like this. Both of those mean foot pounds. We will also be talking about weight density of water. So to get ready for weight density of water, let's first remember that oftentimes density is use, use the, the symbol rho and we have the formula for mass divided by volume. So usually, usually think of density as mass divided by volume and you use the symbol rho. So with weight density, we're gonna use delta for that. And that, instead of mass, it is actually just weight divided by volume. And we use the Greek letter delta here. And another thing we should probably get used to is Newton's second law force equals mass times acceleration. And we're gonna be talking about weight a lot. So weight is actually a force. So when we talk about weight, we have mass times acceleration, but it's acceleration due to gravity. So we usually use the, the letter G for acceleration due to gravity. So weight density of water. With a metric system, it is 9,800 newtons per cubic meter. So it's basically saying if you have a cubic meter of water, the weight of that would be 9,800 newtons. 
And if you use the US system, we will use 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. Now this number, sometimes you see in calculus book 62.4. It does vary because near the equator, this is actually about 62.26 pounds per cubic foot. And near the poles, it's about 62.59 pounds per cubic foot. So of course, it, gravity varies along the surface of the earth. So um, usually uh, you'll see either 62.5 or 62.4. Really, you know, just depends on on which calculus book you're using. So what happens is for weight, these numbers are taking into account the force of gravity acting on the water. So instead of having the, the mass density, you actually have the weight density here. So this is basically saying if you have a cubic foot of, of water, it'll weigh about 62 and a half pounds. And, uh, you know, just to get this picture in your mind, a cubic foot of water is just under seven and a half gallons. And a gallon of water weighs around 8.3, 8.4 pounds, somewhere around there. Okay, so with this, we are ready to take a look at our first example. Example one, how much work against gravity is required to lift a leaky five pound bucket from the ground into the air by pulling in 20 feet of rope? If the rope weighs 0 0.08 pounds per foot and the bucket starts with 16 pounds of water, leaks at a constant rate and finishes draining just as it reaches the top. All right, not the most realistic problem, but it does allow us to put some of these pieces together and see how this all works. So we, we really need to consider lifting the bucket, lifting the rope, and lifting the water. And that's what we'll do. So we'll first take a look at how much work was done lifting the bucket. Now the bucket, it says weighs five pounds. Okay, so the the weight of that bucket is five pounds and it doesn't change. So weight is the force and it's constant in this case. So we can just use work equals force times distance. The, the weight is the force and the weight is five pounds and we're gonna move this thing 20 feet. So this one is just gonna be five times 20 which is 100. But 5 what and 20 what and 100 what? So remember that the 5 here, this is going to be the, the weight in pounds. This is 20 feet. So the answer is going to be 100 foot pounds. And also, when you're working on the problems, you're just going to have to look at the units that are given to determine whether we're going to use the, the metric system or the U.S. customary system. So in this case, these are all given in U.S. customary system units, so I'll just stick with that. So, so far we've got 100 foot-pounds of work, and that was lifting the bucket. So now let's consider lifting the rope. This is going to be a different kind of situation. So think about just a little picture here. We've got this rope. It's tied to the bucket here. So we've got this bucket and it's tied to the rope. So when we are first pulling in this rope, we're lifting the entire rope. But as the rope gets lifted, we're, as we lift this rope up, we, we'll be lifting less and less and less of the rope. So it weighs 0 0.08 pounds a foot, so initially we're lifting the entire 20 feet of rope, but as we pull this bucket up, there's less and less rope being lifted, right? Because the, the rope up here would just be like hanging over on the, on, the, on the roof. So let's consider this one. We can see this force is going to vary because the weight of the rope varies depending on how much rope you have. So in this case, when we figure out the work we are going to have this version of force times distance. So we're going to go from A to B, and basically this force is going to be the weight. This will be the weight of the rope. This will be the weight of the rope. 
And so what we're going to have is we're going to lift from 0 to 20 feet. And the, rate, the weight of the rope is 0 0.08 pounds per foot. So depending on what X is, as X goes from 0 to 20, that'll tell us how much the weight, how much the rope weighs. So when the whole thing is lifted, and we're at 0, it won't have any weight. But initially, we've got 20 would be filled in here. So we have 20 times 0 0.08, which would be the, entire, the weight of the entire rope. And then we're going to just integrate across here. So if we do a little integration here, we use a power rule, this x to the first power becomes x squared, then we divide by 2. So what we end up with over here is 0 0.04 x squared from 0 to 20. And when we plug these in, plug 20 in there and square it times by 0 0.04, then of course subtracting the 0, which won't make any difference, we're going to end up getting 16 foot-pounds. So as far as the rope goes, lifting the rope is going to take us 16 foot-pounds of work. There is another way we can figure out this work done lifting the rope. Just using some geometry here, if we have a, let's say, force versus distance or amount pulled curve, we just have this, our uh, force 0.08x here. And if we go out to, let's say, 20, that's 20, and we could find the area underneath this, this force curve. And so if we go out to 20, then F would be 1.6. And we could really just find the area under this, this curve by using the area of a, of a triangle. So now the area equals one half base times height, which in this case would be one half twenty times one point six, which also comes out to be sixteen. So in this case, because the force is point zero eight x, and we know this is just a straight line, when we have a straight line force, we could actually use geometry to get this answer too. But of course, we want to go, we want to use this because this will work. Uh, even if we don't have something that we can think of geometrically, you know, this could be some crazy polynomial and this will still, this will still work. But I just wanted to show you that in this particular case, we could interpret this also as the error under the curve of a, of, of a straight line like this one. And then we come to part C. This is the part that takes the most work, really. And in this point, this part we want to find out how much work was done in lifting the water so think when we start when we start the water's on the ground we could think of it as like position zero and all the water is there all 16 pounds of water so you could think of it like this let's say we start our starting point i'm going to say position equals zero and weight equals 16 and then we can think of this as a point like 0 16 and then when we are finished now the position equals 20 and the bucket is empty all the water is gone so the weight equals 0 so you could think of this as 20 0 and we'll think of the position like being the distance and we could have that be x, so position would be x, so this would be like x, the weight could be our, our y. And then from here we could treat this like an equation of a line through two points. We could find the slope through the line, so the slope is going to be 16 minus 0, y2 minus y1 over 0 minus 20, right? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And that ends up giving us, if you simplify, negative 4 over 5. So we can use these two data points to come up with an equation of a line because it did tell us that this, the water leaks at a constant rate. So because of that, 
we know we can use an equation of a line to describe this. So we've got our slope here. We also have our, our y-intercept, right? So when we come up with our equation of line, y equals mx plus b, here's our y-intercept, 0, 016. Or if you, don't, if you didn't see that, you know, all you would have to do is do what we normally do here. We plug in the slope, negative 4 over 5, pick a point like 0 and 16, and plug in that for 0, that for y, and then you solve for b, and we'll, we'll end up getting the same thing. But just to, to save a little time here, let's just um, use the fact that we know our y-intercept is 16, and we can come up with our equation of a line. So we could say, okay, so our line is y equals negative 4 fifths x plus 16. What this gives us, this gives the weight of the water weight of the water at height x. So we plug in the height and we've got the weight. So initially the height is 0. Plug in a 0 there and we get the weight is 16. When we're all when we're at the top the height is 20. You plug in a 20 here and you're going to get negative 16 plus 16. So then y which would be the weight would be zero. So because we've got this formula here, the weight of the water, the weight remembers the force, the force at height x. So to figure out the work required to move this, we can come back to this formula, f of x dx. Again, this is the weight, the force is the weight. So then we can integrate, we can go 0 to 20. Our force is going to be 16. I'm just going to write it like this. Minus 4 fifths x dx. So then to integrate that, we would get 16x minus 2 fifths x squared from 20 to 0. Right? Power rule. This goes up by 1, and we divide by 2 which is like multiplying by one half. So then we get here. So if we plug these in, I'm gonna go ahead and plug the 20 in here and here, and then minus, and then plug the zero in, which of course would just give us a zero. Plug in the 20 in, we will get 16 times 20, minus two fifths times 20 squared, and when you go through the math, let's see, we're going to get 320 minus 2 fifths times 400. And a little bit of algebra, a little bit of arithmetic, actually, we get 160 foot-pounds. So we can add that into our total. 160 foot-pounds to move the water. So the total work done, total work is what we're looking for, the total work will be, we've got 100 plus 16 plus 160, which gives us 276 foot-pounds. So the answer to the original question, 276 foot-pounds. Often in calculus, there'll be some overlap with your physics classes. And this may be one of those times, you may have studied Hooke's Law in physics, Hooke's Law, uh, named after Robert Hooke, who was a uh, probably mid to late 1600s um, scientist, studied physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, had some legendary quarrels with Isaac Newton. But Hooke's Law is the, just says that the force required to stretch or compress a spring X units from its natural length is directly proportional to x. Now what I want to emphasize is it says from its natural length. We want to keep that in mind when we're solving these problems. It will make, it will eliminate a pretty common mistake if you keep that in mind, from its natural length. And it says that this uh, force is directly proportional to x. And just like from algebra, when you have a function that is directly proportional to x, it looks just like this, and k is some proportionality constant.
In this case, k is called the, the spring constant. Now, real springs approximate this within certain limits. Uh, but uh, the note here is just that the greater the value of k, the stiffer or stronger the spring. Okay, and there's another little note here. When stretched beyond its elastic limit, the spring will be permanently deformed and this law will no longer apply. And the model typically starts to break down before the spring reaches its elastic limit. Um, I was I actually read that Pixar, when they made the film Brave, they use Hooke's Law to model the curly hair of characters in the movie. And I guess they had to make a, a few adjustments so to make it look real, but it started with uh, Hooke's Law. So let's take a look at this example. So this says, find the work required to compress the spring from its natural length of 1 foot to a length of 0.75 feet if the spring constant is k equals 16 pounds per foot. One thing I want you to notice right away they're looking for work, right? They're looking for work, so keep that in mind. Because sometimes they'll be asking us about a force. So we just wanna keep track of what they're asking us. This question is asking about the work required to compress the spring. So it says that K equals 16. So K equals 16. We also know that Hooke's Law says that F of X equals K times X. So in our case, f of x equals 16x. And remember, this is a force, 16x. So if we want to find work, we have to integrate that force, right? So if we have work, we're going to integrate f of x dx from a to b, right? Here's the force. Here's Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law gives us this, this force, which in this case is right here. To find the work, we have to integrate. We integrate the force. So to set this one up, we have work equals. And we leave these limits blank for a second and fill in 16x dx. And here's where we have to be careful. It says the work required to compress the spring from its natural length of one foot to a length of 0.75 feet. So, an easy mistake to make is just plug a one in here. It's so easy, there's a one there, put a one here, but don't do it. Remember, Hooke's Law says, it's the force required to stretch or compress the spring from X units from its natural length. So here's its natural length of one. We're gonna compress this thing 0.25 feet. So we're starting from its natural length. Right? So there's no, it's not compressed when we're starting. We're starting at its natural length of one foot, and then we're compressing it 0.25 feet. So we have a 0.25 here. This is the easiest thing to make a mistake here. Just put a 1 and a 0.75 or something like that. But it's starting from its natural length. So we start at 0. We're starting at no stretching or compressing, right, from its natural length. Start at zero. And then in this case, we're going to compress it because it's going from one foot to 0.75 feet. So we're compressing it by 0.25 feet. Okay, so we integrate here, and we will just use the power rule. So this becomes x squared. We divide by 2, so we're going to get 8x squared from 0 to 0.25. And if you go ahead and plug in a quarter there and square it, you get 1 16th. 8 times 1 16th is 1 half or 0.5 foot-pounds. And just let me make a little note here, because this is the part that usually gives us trouble. So this is all about the distance compressed or stretched. 
compressed in this case. So remember, we started from its natural length. We're starting at zero. We're compressing it 0.25 feet. Let's try another one. This one says, example three, a spring has a natural length of one meter. A force of 24 newtons stretches the spring to a length of 1.8 meters. So we started at one meter, stretch it to 1.8 meters with a force of 24 newtons. So let's find the spring constant K. All right, so we have a formula. We know that force is equal to K times X. And they give us the force, 24 newtons. It stretches the spring to a length of 1.8 meters. So again, here's the key. Its natural length is one meter, and it got stretched to a length of 1.8 meters. So the distance stretched, this distance x, is 0 0.8. 0 0.8, right? Not 1.8. Natural length of one meter, it was stretched to a length of 1.8 meters. So x is 0 0.8, right? That's the amount it was stretched. So we would have, let's see, 24 newtons equals k times 0.8 meters so then if we want to get k by itself we just divide by 0.8 meters 0.8 meters now, i'm first purposely keeping the units in here just so, to see what we're going to get here so k is going to be 24 over 0.8 which is actually 30 newtons per meter just so we can see the the units here. And again, the number one mistake to make here is to start here and put 1.8 in here. But remember, we want to, x, x is the distance the spring is stretched, right? That's x, the distance it is stretched. It's stretched 0.8 meters. Okay, so we have our spring constant k, which is 30 newtons per meter. So then it says, how much work will it take to stretch the spring to a length of three meters. Well, now we're asking about work, right? They're asking about work. So work, we know, is just going to be the integral from A to B of F of X dx. F is our force, right? F is equal to K times X. So in this case, we're going to go, our k is 30. We just found that k is 30, so it's going to be 30x dx. And then here's where I have to be careful. So we're going to stretch the spring to a length of 3 meters. Well, its natural length, it says, is 1 meter. So we're going to start at 1 meter. So we're starting with no stretch. And we're stretching it to three meters, so we're going to stretch it by two meters, right? Zero to two, because we're starting at one meter, which is, it's, it's said in the first part of the problem here. The spring is a natural length of one meter. We're going to stretch it to a length of three meters, so we're stretching it by two meters. So we integrate this, and we end up with 15x squared from two to zero. You plug in two there and square it. You get four, multiply by 15 and you get 60. And now it's work. So we need the unit of work, which is joules. So it's 60 joules. Okay, then they have one more question here. How far will a force of 45 Newtons stretch the spring? Okay, again, just keeping track of what they're talking about here. This is a, a force, right? Talk about force. So we know that force, Newton, not Newton, um, Hooke's Law says force equals K times X. And this time they're giving us a force of 45 Newtons. So we could just plug in 45. And we know our spring constant K is 30 and we're looking for x, so we are here. We just divide each side by 30 to get x by itself. And we'll get x equals 45 over 30, or 1.5 meters. All right, so hopefully those will, will 
give you what you need to uh, start working on the problems involving Hooke's Law. Another topic in this section is work done in pumping fluids or moving fluids out of a tank. So for this example, before we get started, let's first review some basics that we're going to need. And I've got a way that I think is is fairly straightforward and and one of the easier ways to demonstrate how to do this. But first, we need some basics. So just to review, remember that force equals mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. And then also, for us, we're going to write it as mass times g, right? Mass times acceleration due to gravity. Also, recall that density is mass over volume. This is Greek letter rho, or density, uh, or mass density, mass over volume. And we also have a weight density. Delta is equal to weight over volume. And of course, weight is just mass times gravity. Right, so weight is a force, right, mass times gravity. But if you look at this first equation here, we could solve this for weight. I could multiply each side of this equation by V, and then we'll get something that we're going to need, which is that weight equals weight density times volume, and we will need this. So in solving these, these kind of problems up here, working pumping fluids, we're going to use this. We use this fact that weight equals uh, weight density times volume. And also just keep in mind that weight density of water, the numbers that we'll use here for water, we're going to use 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. And this is, we're using the uh, James Stewart textbook, and this is the number that they use. Other textbooks use 62.4. Again, weight density varies depending on where you are on Earth. So uh, if you need to use 62.4, just use that instead. And then when we're using the metric system, we will use 9,800 newtons per cubic meter. Okay, so that's some things we'll need. Also, just as a quick check, let's check the units here. Make sure everything makes sense. So we're saying that weight equals weight density times volume. So if we're using the U.S. customary system, we would have weight would be in pounds equals weight density, which would be pounds per cubic foot times volume, which would be cubic feet. So we can see those would cancel and the units seem to work out okay. Another little note here. In our book, in the Stewart book, it mentions that the density of H2O, the density of water, is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So what that's saying is that, I'll say, therefore, the weight density of H2O, to switch from mass to weight, we, just, we multiply by acceleration due to gravity. So if we're using the metric system, that'd be 9.8 meters per second squared times 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And that is how they end up in the book with saying that the weight density of water is 9,800 newtons per cubic meter. Right, so with that review out of the way, let's see about tackling this problem. So we are looking for how much work it takes to pump all the water out of a full cylindrical, so it's a full cylindrical tank. If the height of the tank is eight feet and the radius of the base is six feet. The strategy we're gonna use is we're gonna find the work needed to pump a sample section of water to the top of the tank. And then we're just going to use an integral to sum all of the sample pieces of work. So a sketch a little picture here, and what we're gonna do is we've got this, this tank that is six feet in diameter, so it's six feet across here, and it's eight feet tall, so it's eight feet like this. What we're gonna do 
is consider the work it takes to take a little thin sample of water, this little section of water, the sample section. We're going to see how much work does it take to move this thing to the top. It'd be work done against gravity to move this little slice to the top. And then we're going to just integrate for all these little sample slices. And because we're taking the integral, we're going to, in behind the integral is the limit, we'll be taking the limit as these become thinner and thinner. So this little thickness will be infinitely thin. And we're going to then see how long or how much work it would take to move all of these little thin sample sections to the top of the tank. So in order to do that, let's just consider this little sample and let's think of the volume, the volume of our sample section. Well, if you look at this, isn't this just a little cylinder? A little cylinder, right? The volume of a cylinder is just the area times the height, right? It's just the area of the base times the height. So in this case, we've, since it's just a cylinder, we've got the volume equals the area of the base, which is pi r squared, right? It's just a circle, times h. In this case, we know that for this circle here, the radius is 6, right? So for us, the volume is going to be pi 6 squared h, which is just 36 pi. And now here's where we're going to use the height of this, a little thickness here, the height of this thin cylinder. Well, you can see this height is going, it's acting along the y-axis. So the height, we'll consider this height the little change in y, and we'll call it dy. So the, the thickness of that, or the height of that cylinder, this little thickness right here, we're going to call that thickness dy. So that gives us the volume. So we start, we're going to look for the volume. Then we're going to consider, well, what is the weight? Now keep in mind, weight is a force, right? So what is the weight of this sample section? Well, we know that the weight is equal to the weight density times the volume. So that's going to be the weight density in the U.S. customary system is 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. So we have 62.5 times 36 pi dy. Right, so this is our, our weight density, 62.5. And our volume, which you found right here, 36 pi dy. So now we have the volume and we've got the weight or the force. And now we need to think about the distance. What's the distance the sample section or sample slice, however you want to think of it, must be moved? Well, this is going to depend on where this is. So if it's on the very bottom, that piece has to be moved eight feet, right? And then if it's near the top, it barely has to be moved at all to get it to the top of here where it would be. Think of it like we're going to move it up here till it spill, spills over the top. So to do this, we need to just think about, well, this here, I'm just going to call that Y. If this is the origin, if, if this is an x, y plane, and this is the origin, this height would be y. So then the distance we're going to move it, we have to move it up to here. Well, this is 8 right here, so this distance here is going to be 8 minus y. So this distance to be moved is 8 minus y. Right? It is at y, whatever this point is here is y. It needs to move up here. So it's going to be 8 minus y. And just as a check, if I add these two together, 8 minus y plus y, I get 8. And that is how, how tall this is. All right, so that distance then, the distance is going to be 8 minus y. And now once we have this, then we can figure out the work. The work required to move our sample section well, that work is going to be force times distance. Here's our force right there. 
here's our distance right here. So force times distance, we're going to multiply those together, and we're going to get 62.5 times 36 pi dy times 8 minus y. And now we're ready to find the total work required to move all of these sample slices out of here. It's going to come down to this. So the total work required, we need an integral now. The total work, we've got this integral, and we're going to basically take this 62.5 times 36 pi. I'm going to just rearrange these a little bit and write 8 minus y dy. And then we are going to integrate wherever these slices are, wherever these sample sections of water are. And they are going to be everywhere from 0 to 8 because it said this is full. So we're going to integrate from 0 to 8. And as a reminder, we're always going to integrate where the fluid is. The fluid is all the way here. So we're going to go from 0 to 8. And then if you, if you clean this up a little bit, now of course these constants, they can all come out in front of the integral. If you multiply those all together, you get 2250 pi. And then you integrate from 0 to 8, 8 minus y dy. Now one thing you notice in these work with the work problems a lot of times, well not all the time, but a lot of times once you get them set up, the integrals are fairly simple integrals. It's the, the setup that takes the work. So I'm sure we can all integrate this one. And once you do the integration, you end up with getting 72,000 pi foot pounds. So remember, we're going to need the units. The units are important. So in this case, we will be using foot pounds. I had mentioned that we want to integrate where the water is. This is something that will make life easier if you always keep this in mind. So let's say that tank were only half full. If it were only half full, our integral would look a little different. So that we would have, well, basically the integral would be the same, but the limits would be different, the limits of integration. So if it were half full, we would integrate this integral. But we're going to integrate where the water is. So if it were half full, the water would be in the bottom tank, the bottom of the tank from 0 to 4 feet. So if the tank were half full, our slices where the water is, we'd integrate from 0 to 4. You can see the distance will play out here because when I plug in a 0, that one on the bottom has moved the full 8 feet. Now the slice of water that's at the very top, which would be at the 4 foot, at the 4 feet mark, that would move 8 minus 4 or 4 feet. So you can sort of see that it comes into play here, but we integrate where the water is. So if it's half full, we're integrating from 0 to 4. On the other hand, if we're going to empty half the tank, which would be the top half, right? We're going to move the top half of the water out and then leave the bottom half. Then we would have, uh, whoops, let's see. We have this the same integral, 2250 pi times 8 minus y dy. But now we're, gonna, we're going to remove the top half of the water. We integrate where the water is. So in this case, we would go from 4 to 8. And if you do these integrals, if you calculate these, you're going to get 54,000 pi foot-pounds of work to integrate the, to move the bottom half of the tank. And over here, the top half takes less work because you don't have to move it as far, right? Makes sense, right? This is the, the top half of the tank. The water doesn't have to move as far. And so this would be 18,000 pi foot-pounds. And again, you can see the distance if you, if you think how we set this up. The, the 8 minus 4, the most you had to move water here is 4 feet, and then the top half won't even move at all. So another thing to notice is that when you add these up, you add this up, and you add this up, and when you do that, you're going to get what we got before, which is when we, when we emptied the entire tank, we got 72,000 pi foot-pounds. This next example is a little bit more complicated version. 
where we've got a conical tank with vertex down and it is half full by height of water. And how much work is required to pump all the fluid in this tank to a height of four feet above the top of the tank? So we're talking about work against gravity. And so say there's the top of the tank here, we're gonna go up another four feet. So you can imagine some little spout or some nozzle or hole here where the water will come out up an additional four feet and then come out of the hole up there. It says the height of the tank is eight feet. The radius of, of the tank is six feet at the top. So what we need to do is draw a picture of our little sample slice of water. So imagine we had something like this. This little sample slice of water has got a little bit of a thickness to it. So again, we're gonna we're gonna treat it like a cylinder, even though there's a, a of course there's a little curve on the side of the cylinder, so it wouldn't be a true cylinder. But we're gonna take the limit as the cylinder becomes infinitely thin. So the limiting value, since that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna integrate. And remember, behind all the integration problems, there are limits. So it won't really matter that this is not a true cylinder because we'll be taking the limit. So it will be like an infinitely thin cylinder. And of course, we will just use integration to sum all of the pieces wherever the water is. So let's start. We'll do the same thing that we did last time. We'll just consider this little sample piece here. We'll think of the, the volume of the sample section. Well, volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, or in this case, you're gonna have pi. Now what we're gonna need here, we're gonna need this distance to the radius. Now this radius is gonna change, right? It'll be a lot smaller for this little cylinder down here than for this one up here, which would be going all across here. So this distance is really going to be whatever this x coordinate is right there, right? Our radius is going to be whatever the x coordinate is right here at this point for this particular sample slice. And of course, for this smaller sample slice down here, x would be smaller. So it's going to change this time. It's not a constant like it was the last time when we had a, uh, a cylinder or a cylindrical tank. This time we've got a cone. So it's going to be pi, a radius is x, so it's going to be pi x squared dy. It's dy because look at this thickness. This thickness of this little cylinder is a thickness along the y-axis. It's along the y-axis, so the thickness is going to be a dy. The little change in y will be the thickness of that. Okay, so then we also, we've got the volume. Now we figure out the weight the weight, which is our force, right? This is our force. So the weight of us of our sample section or our sample slice is gonna be the weight density times the volume. Weight density is 62.5. So the weight would be 62.5 pi x squared dy. Then we need to think about the distance we need to move this this little sample section. So we've got something going on over here. This is 12 feet total, right? It's gotta be, there's this 12 feet total here because this is, the cone is eight feet high, then it moves four feet above this. So basically what we've got, we've got this little distance right here, which is Y, and then that slice is gonna have to be moved all the way up to here, four feet above here. And it's a total of 12 feet. So if this is y, this this coordinate here, the the this point has a y coordinate, which is this height. So then this distance here is gonna be 12 minus y. That's the distance that we're gonna have to move this sample slice. So the distance sample slice must be moved. is gonna be equal to 12 minus y. So we've got our force, now I've got our distance so we can figure out the work. The work required to move our sample slice 
is going to be, well, we're going to use work equals force times distance. So we've got work equals our force is 62.5 pi x squared dy times our distance is 12 minus y. So we can think of the total work to move all of these little sample sections from here all the way up to the top of the cone. We can figure that out by using integration. So you can see the total work is equal to the integral of 62.5 pi x squared dy times 12 minus y. And now we need to integrate always where the water is. And it told us this was half full by height. So if this is eight feet, half full by height would be like four feet. So it's four feet. So we need to integrate where the water is. So we need to start at the bottom here at zero and go up to four feet. So we could go zero to four. And so if we clean this up a little bit and bring the constants out front, we're gonna get 62.5 pi. The integral from 0 to 4, we'll have x squared times 12 minus y dy. And here is where we may notice a problem. This is a dy problem. We're going to differentiate with respect to y. And all good, all is good here, 12 minus y, but this x squared is going to be a problem. So we need to somehow get rid of x squared. So we need a relationship between x and y so that we can eliminate x squared and put a y, some sort of y here instead. So we need to look back at our problem. Usually you look at the geometry of the problem and see if there's any way we can find a relationship between x and y. And we really can, if you think about this, the way this cone is, if this is six feet across here, this is eight feet across here, we could sort of think of this branch right here of this cone could think of this as being a line that goes to the point zero zero and also it goes to this point here six eight so we could really just find the equation of a line that goes to these two points and that would give us some relationship between x and y and that's really what we need a relationship between x and y so let's do that off to the side here we have got y equals mx plus b, an equation of a line. And we all learned in algebra how to find an equation of a line through these through any two points, right? So we find the slope. You could find the slope here. So the slope is equal to, I'm just going to use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And I will get 8 minus 0 over 6 minus 0, which is 8 over 6 or 4 over 3. And then this one's kind of an easy one because the y-intercept is just zero, right? The y-intercept is zero. So we know what m is, and now we know b is just zero. So the equation of that line is just y equals four-thirds x. Now, of course, over here, what we need, we need to solve this for x and so we can have x in terms of y. So over here... If I just multiply each side of this equation by 3 fourths, right, then we would get x is equal to 3 fourths y. And now we're okay, because now we can just say, okay, we've got an x squared here. If this is x, x squared, we would square this whole thing, right? So if we want to find x squared, we just square this whole thing, and we'll get x squared equals... 9 sixteenths y squared. And for the integral, I'm just going to move the 9 sixteenths out front and then put the y squared in here. So then what we would have is total work is 62.5 pi times 9 sixteenths times the integral from 0 to 4 of y squared times 12 minus y dy. Okay, and this integral, again, like most of them, the setup is the tricky part. The integrals oftentimes are pretty straightforward. Here, of course, we could just distribute this through here and then use the power rule a couple of times. And if you do that, what you should get 
is 6750 pi foot pounds. I should mention also with these type of cone problems, there's a, there's a couple of ways to get this relationship here where, where you find out that you need a relationship between X and Y. Uh, in the Stewart textbook, Stewart uses uh, sim uses triangles to figure this out, and it, it works fine too. I just I like this way it's, is easier. It, it seems when I teach, it seems like most students relate to this way better. But uh, there's another way to do it. So if that doesn't seem right, you can look in the in the textbook and you'll see another way to set up this problem. So let's take a look. One last example. And this one says, how long would it take? A one half horsepower pump operating at full efficiency to empty this tank. Well, first little note about this pump operating at full efficiency. That is never going to even come close to happening. Now that's because when I worked at the uh, engineering firm before I was teaching, we would sometimes have to pump out uh, manholes. We worked for the city and sometimes you'd have to get down there and look at the telecommunications they had their electric lines and their communications lines with copper wiring and fiber optics and, and sometimes they wouldn't drain correctly so to get down there you'd have to first pump them out and the answer that we're going to get in a problem like this is going to be at least an order of magnitude off at least so there's just so many losses in a pumping process there's losses due to friction from hoses pipes connections etc there's turbulence there's just there's a lot of losses so the answer we get here just keep in mind we're probably gonna have to multiply it by 10 or maybe even a hundred to get anything close to the the realistic answer also sometimes uh the question is asked why are manhole covers round there's a lot of different reasons for this but one of them is kind of interesting is they're just easy to use if they were square, you'd have to line up the corners with a round one. You just pop it in place. Also, if they were square and you didn't insert it correctly and it went across the diagonal, it would fall right in the hole. So the circular round holes, they're very strong. And if you have a beveled edge or maybe a lip on it, it can't fall into the manhole cover. So they're, they're pretty easy to work with. But let's take a look at this problem and see what would happen. So power is the rate of doing work. or dw dt. It's a derivative of work with respect to time. And one horsepower is equivalent to 550 foot-pounds per second. And is equal to roughly 746 watts. So units of measure that you see for power a lot of times are, are horsepower, watts, sometimes foot-pounds per second. So for this one, we can look at the work required, which according to our answer we got, was 6750 pi foot-pounds. We can divide that by, we have got a half horsepower. So one half horsepower would be, what, 550 divided by 2. So let's clean this up a little bit. 550 divided by 2 would be 275. Now this up here in the numerator, this is work in foot-pounds. And this 275, this is power. So this is going to be half horsepower, be 275 foot-pounds per second. And we can see if we divide this out, we will get some units to cancel and we'll get approximately... 77 seconds now of course this thing operating at full efficiency is extremely unrealistic so uh in a perfect world where there's no losses no friction everything is absolutely perfect we get 77 seconds but as i mentioned before that's going to be way off and if you did this kind of work quite a bit you'd probably have some sort of multiplier you could use to give you a reasonable answer so we'll just leave it at 77 seconds so that should that should uh, give you what you need go ahead and try the the homework problems out they're they're a little challenging 
just remember to break everything into tiny pieces and then integrate across all the pieces and let me know if you have any questions.